Snowgoer Live, brought to you by Snowgoer Magazine and Snowgoer.com. From sled reviews to breaking news, riding destinations to gear evaluations, Snowgoer is snowmobiling. Now, here's our host, Snowgoer Editor, John Prusak. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Snowgoer Live, where we bring you some of the most interesting people and stories in the sport of snowmobiling. We have a special treat for you today as we're joined by arguably the most dominant snowmobile racer of all time. Tucker Hibbert splashed onto the scene in 2000 when he won the X Games gold medal in snowcross at the tender age of 15. Over the next 18 years, he smashed every record in the sport, winning an incredible 134 pro snowcross finals, 11 national points championships, and 10 X Games gold medals before shutting down his career in 2018. Since then, Tucker's kept kind of a low profile and has become a bit of a mystery to many sled heads. Rumors of him growing a long beard were just that, but he did tell us off camera that he became rather shaggy after his retirement, going 18 months without a haircut. He joins us today from his home and shop in Pelican Rapids, Minnesota. And joining us now, the driver of the number 68 who entertained us for all those years, Tucker Hibbert. How you doing, Tucker? I'm doing awesome. Thanks for having me. Looks like you have a fine shop there in the background. Hopefully you're, you're enjoying life these days. Yeah, we've been uh, having some fun just playing around outside and enjoying, uh, enjoying our time for sure. Perfect. Well, let's jump right into it. Let's jump back to the, to the very beginning. Um, at what age, because you started at such a young age, you know, on, on where we got to start seeing you, but you, you started doing stuff well before that. At what age did you really start thinking uh, that you wanted to race for a living, whether that was motocross or snowcross or whatever? Uh, I guess when I was maybe like 12, 13 years old is when I really started uh, getting excited about racing. I, I had raced for quite a few years before that, but, you know, 12, 13, 14 years old, I really uh, kind of got motivated and fired up about racing and started thinking like, yeah, I could, I could do this, you know, for a while and, and yeah. I think I can be pretty good at it. So yeah, it was, I remember kind of a light switch moment happening once where I was just like, all right, it's time to get serious and, and still have fun, but really take this serious. And yeah, that was probably 12, 13 years old. That sounds so strange because most of us at 12, 13 aren't having a get serious moment, but uh, <laughs> you know, obviously you must've had a pretty young considering what, when you started winning, um, you know, for a lot of people my age, you know, Kirk Hibbert was my hero, but to, to you, he was dad. So, you know, you can't idolize your own dad too much. Did, did you have <laughs> other uh, um, racing heroes growing up or people you want to emulate as, aside from your father? Uh, definitely. But for sure, my dad was my hero. You know, it was okay. cool. He was my dad and my hero and someone that I looked up to a lot. And, you know, back to kind of that moment when I decided to start getting serious with racing, a lot, a lot of that or all of it had to do with my dad. And, uh, you know, just growing up in a, a family that, um, that had, some pretty good values and really good work ethic. And, you know, my, my family came from farming and I grew up around an atmosphere where you worked really hard for, for everything you did. And uh, I think that really taught me, you know, the, you know, laid the groundwork for me in racing and how I was going to approach preparation for racing and competing and everything. So, so yeah, definitely my dad was a huge hero of mine and I grew up, you know, watching him race and, and uh, just thinking that was so cool. And my uncle as well. And, um, yeah. and then once, uh, you know, once we moved to Minnesota and I started seeing more racers and more people, obviously I had tons of people that I looked up to. As a kid, I just loved being at the racetrack with my dad uh, before I was racing and just hanging out in the pits, going from trailer to trailer, probably annoying people more than anything. But for <laughs> me, it was just, uh, it was so cool to be around uh, racing at that level and, and, you know, just being able to kind of have a all access pass to uh, behind the scenes of racing. And that really uh, opened my eyes and, and got me fired up about it. You know, one of the, one of the things that was amazing uh, for your, your first high profile win, I mean, I, w I was there in Vermont when you won the X games, when you were just 15 and, you know, here's this diminutive teenager who's ripping around the track and just has such confidence. You could just see it in the way you rode that, that you didn't, feel or it didn't look like it to me that you felt in any way out of place um to what do you attribute that to that that a 15 year old can go out there and just have that confidence to, to make something like that happen 
Um, it just came really natural to me for sure. But, um, I rode so much, like as a kid, I started out on a little kitty cat and a Suzuki three wheeler and, and just slowly kind of graduated up. And, um, you know, I think what I really, uh, learned the most and, and kind of honed my skills the most was on a, a snow scoot, the old Yamaha snow scoots. And uh -huh. I, I rode that thing so much when I was a little kid, just lap after lap around the yard making little tracks and just that's all I wanted to do was ride so uh, by the time I started racing uh, and even you know before some of the races you were just talking about as a semi-pro racing some district races in Minnesota here and regionals and stuff like I had so many laps under my belt at that point and so much seat time on on all kinds of different snowmobiles um, and and that all came just from the love of riding like I just loved to ride. So for me, when I was able to start competing, especially at the national level, I had so much uh, experience built up and so much uh, practice, even though it wasn't on an actual snowcross track. Uh, right. um, I, did, I think it just kind of felt natural and, and just came to me really quick. So I think that's, that's the biggest thing was just all the, all the preparation I had uh, as a kid before I started competing. Those snow scoots were uh, so fun, but they were also uh, the the handling on them was you know kind of kind of sketchy, top heavy kind of a feel to them. So that was probably a good thing to train on as a kid looking back now. But uh, <laughs> that's an aside. So I I, I guess I wouldn't want to compare you to a, I don't know a, a Corey Haim or a Britney Spears or, or a, you know childhood stars that had wayward <laughs> years uh, after they made it big too young. But was it hard to stay focused when you had that much success that early? I mean, what, what kept you locked in when you set such a high bar for yourself when you're, you know, still in high school? Yeah, it, it wasn't really hard. I don't remember it being an issue, really. My parents, I think, uh, did a really good job of kind of keeping me in check and making sure I didn't uh, get too too high on myself and my racing and, um, and you know, made sure I, I went to school and got good grades and did the chores at home. And, like, it wasn't a – it wasn't like – all of a sudden a rock star life and I'm doing whatever I want. I was still a, a kid living at home and, and yeah. taking up the trash and picking up sticks on the yard and doing all the chores with my dad. So um, I think most of it just, again, my, my whole life up upbringing with my family kind of just set me up to, to understand that you got to work hard and appreciate what you have and, and not take it for granted and just kind of keep chugging along. Getting back to the the kind of the the success so young. So you, you you after you win the X Games, you go back, you finish your semi pro year, and then you you turn pro shortly after that. Um, and you're up there on a on a weekly basis, you know, challenging the 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 new hero at the time, Mr. Blair Morgan, and, and things like that. And you're winning races and championships. From the outside looking in, it still looked pretty incredible. But but you're living it. You're not standing beside the track analyzing. It. Did you realize? then or do you realize now how unusual that was yeah for sure i think i did realize at that point you know like i was quite a bit younger than most of my competitors and and able to have success really quickly so it was i knew it wasn't a normal you know situation but at the same time it was it was just uh in the moment racing and and doing what i needed to do and not really thinking that much about it um you know from the from a from an outsider's perspective but just really just racing and enjoying it and trying to do better. And, and that's what I was focused on. But definitely, I think there was, a, you know, a, a sense of this is this is a little different than most people at my age. I remember uh, one time, I think it was at the Duluth Snowcross, uh, they were grooming the track or something and several of the racers came out on the hill and were just kind of eyeing up the track. And you were hanging out with a lot of the semi-pro guys then, but I suppose they were basically your age. I mean, you're you, everyone who was racing pro at the time, not everyone, but most of the guys who were racing pro at that time were, you know, five, 10 years older than you or in your dad's case, 20. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I, I think it was a, it was a, a situation where I was young for, you know, for my skill level, I guess. Um, but also it was like my first year or two as a pro was really, there was kind of a group of racers that were older, like my dad, um, that were just kind of on the tail end of their career. So I think it almost made it look a little bit, uh, yeah. you know, more extreme than it was. Uh, just kind of the, the timing worked where there was a changing of, you know, some of the older racers moving out uh, that were very successful, that were some of the big names. So I think that had some to do with it. But definitely, you know, I had a I had a little more in common with the semi-pro racers that were more my age, definitely. Yeah. 
so then so so you have that early success you're you're in your young 20s and then you decide you want to uh you know kind of only race snowcross part-time and chase some of your motocross dreams uh talk about that push and pull and, and what drew you to to try to to chase that motocross thing for a while and then come back yeah that was a difficult time definitely for me i think you know the first two or three seasons for me as a pro in snowcross i had success and i won some races and and you know definitely was successful i would say but it was not you know i wasn't as happy as i wanted to be i i was frustrated at times when I wasn't winning and just, mm -hmm. I really hadn't figured out racing yet. I think there was quite a bit of pressure there and I felt like I should be winning every race and okay. all the time and just a kid still, you know? So I think I kind of got burnt out on it. Like it, it was, uh, it was fun, but it wasn't like, this is the best thing ever. I just want to do this my whole life. And I started realizing how much I loved motocross and supercross at the same time, which I grew up racing motocross the entire time even before I I started racing snowcross actually sure. so like for me they were both super fun super important uh things that I loved uh to do and just you know I kind of felt like I wanted I want to put more energy into racing motocross and, and doing it year round and see if I can improve my results there and and uh so that's what I did I just decided I'm going to take a little break from snowmobiling and put more effort in the motocross and start racing supercross and see, see what happens. And, uh, that's what I did. It was an interesting, uh, period because you would, you know, you'd still show up at the X games and you, you know, maybe a, a late season race or something like that. So it was kind of a, a staggered schedule. Um, did that kind of play with your riding style or anything when you're, you're on a bike one week and all of a sudden you're in Colorado going up against everybody on a, on a heavier and wider vehicle and then back to the bike? It was a little different. Yeah. I, you know, I always raced both sports, but never at really at the same time. So it was right. kind of a weird, a weird transition, you know, going one day on one back to the <laughs> other. It was, it was a little different for sure, but, um, honestly racing, uh, supercross, especially on the dirt bikes, I, I believe totally improved my snowcross skills, uh, my fitness, my race craft, my approach to, to racing and training, like, um, you know, a lot of people think like, oh, why'd you do that? That's so stupid. And, and I had that, you know, come from people at times. And for me, like the experience was so good. I didn't, uh, I wasn't extremely successful at racing supercross or motocross, but I felt like I was able to accomplish a lot of my goals. But uh, I 100% believe that it transformed my racing uh, for snowcross and allowed me to, to have the success that I did after that. So it was, uh, it was a huge opportunity that I'm glad I took. And and was able to learn a lot. And you know, and and who knows really? I mean, you know, the 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 challenge of going into motocross where you're not one of the best one or two guys, that 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 probably at that age, you know, now looking back, that was probably good for you in terms of of having, you know, people to chase that were, you know, frankly quite a bit better in in motocross. Yeah, it was it was definitely a, a lot of work and a struggle and I and I was not by far not the fastest guy on the track. So for me it was it was a, a really big challenge and an opportunity to learn, like I said, and, and I, I'm really thankful for that opportunity and the people that were involved with that, that helped me along the way. And, um, and again, just, uh, I enjoyed it. Like I had, I have a blast riding and racing dirt bikes. So it was, uh, at that time, like I said, just, it's like, what, I, what do I want to do more? And what do I love them? You know, love doing more. And yeah, it was fun. It was definitely a fun time, but it, uh, Trying to do two sports like that at, at the premier level doesn't uh, doesn't really work. I mean, you can only stretch yourself so thin. And uh, I felt like I did a good job, but I think while I was doing that, uh, my snowcross results weren't as good as they could have been. You know, if I was racing every race and same thing on dirt bikes, but uh, yeah. it was oh. one time for sure. You were you were still coming back and pretty, doing pretty well though. Uh, you have to sell yourself short there. Um, so so back to snowcross so i mean you know we could probably talk for you know we can go year for year through your career and uh, take 12 hours of people's time here on this video but but in general terms you come back you're racking up victories year after year what sort of drive does it take to stay on top to to from machine prep to personal prep to training i mean you know you 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 set a benchmark but then every year you got the rest of the crowd that's all shooting at you and somehow you've got to come back and and top them again what 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 dedication does that take 
Uh, it takes a lot of dedication for sure. I mean, uh, each year that we went, we went to the racetrack, um, we had to find ways to improve and, and ways to get better, both me as an athlete, us as a team, uh, and the equipment, the snowmobile. So there's so much that goes into racing, as, as most people know. Um, it is just an endless battle trying to find ways to improve and get better. And, and there's so many things that you can put your time and energy into. And it's, it's sometimes difficult to kind of break it down and figure out where you really need to place your focus. And fortunately for me, I feel like I had the best possible team around me, my mechanics, my family, uh, my sponsors, everybody that was involved with my racing was, was top notch, like the highest level people that, that I could ever ask for. So for me, that gave us the ability to figure out what's our weaknesses, what's, uh, what are things we can improve on. Obviously from year to year, the equipment changes, the rules change. Um, so there's so many variables that are going on all at once, but at the end of the day, just for me and for our team, it was just all about analyzing where we could get better and doing whatever we could possible to, to make it happen. You know, a lot of other racers who, who made our top 10 list, uh, maybe changed brands or jumped around or whatever. Your, your path was obviously pretty linear. Um, although, you know, you went from from black magic power in the early days to speed works in the later years and stuff like that. But in general, you were working with a lot of the same high quality people over the years. Does, does, do you think that was a key to your success as well? Definitely. Yeah. I mean, consistency is, is a huge part of success. Obviously you've got to make changes when, when you need to. Uh, but I was fortunate uh, to, to be involved with a lot of really high level uh, people at Arctic Cat and, and my family and, um, right from the beginning, I was able to learn a lot from those people that, that had experience and had the knowledge and, and helped me to understand what it took to be a successful racer. So, um, you know, for us just to, I, I didn't really have any situations where it was like, oh, we tried this and it, it didn't really work or, oh, this, this person isn't right for our team. It was just like everybody gelled so well together all the time that it was it was kind of effortless as a team for us just to to prepare and, and go to the races. And it, it makes it fun that way. But I was fortunate to just have a really solid uh, base of people around me and supporting me that that allowed us to have success. Again, we're talk talking to the number or the driver of the number 68, Tucker Hibbert, who is nice enough to join us here from his home in Pelican Rapids. Um, so several years ago, um, I remember having a conversation with you about, uh, about what sticks with you most. And, and at that point, it, it, you said it's not the big victories, it's the defeats, because that's what motivates you. Um, now that you're retired, has that changed? When you, when you look back on your, your career now, do, you, do, do the, the victories come in, in a stronger focus than the ones that were maybe the near misses that drove you in the past? Yeah, it's both, you know, as a, as any racer knows, you're kind of haunted by the ones that get away and the mistakes yeah. maybe you've made. And, you know, I'm fortunate that I didn't have too many, you know, huge mistakes or huge races that, that we lost for some crazy reason. And it just, you know, it was never really that, that situation for us. We were able to manage the bad races and have them be not too bad and, and obviously had a lot of successful ones. So for me, I, I always focused on just letting stuff go and moving forward and learning from the bad races and things like that. So yeah, yeah. today thinking back, I mean, there's obviously still a few races that I'm like, ah, <laughs> wish I wish I would have, you know, done this or done that and, and whatever, but obviously you can't change those things now, but as a racer, I don't think, you know, I don't think you can ever get those things out of your mind, but for sure the successful races and the good memories are even, even way stronger. And, um, and for me, it's the memories of, uh, of races that we won, or maybe even races we didn't win that yeah. had some special meaning or some special thing came from that with the team, uh, that we celebrated or some crazy funny stories that happened because of something weird going on. It's, it's those things that I really hold close to my heart and, and it's all because of the people and the team uh, that I was with and, and making those memories together. So when, when, when fans, when, uh, you know, people who are into snowcross look back at the Tucker Hibbert era, if you will, what would you want to be remembered for? Are there certain victories or is there a certain approach or anything like that, that you would want people to think uh, that, that Tucker Hibbert, he did this right. Or I remember that time he did that. Um, yeah, I guess, I don't know. I don't, I haven't thought about that too much, but I mean, 
um, I guess just that I, that I never gave up and that I tried my hardest all the time and, and raced fair. Uh, I feel I'm happy to be able to sit here and, and know that I, I don't have big regrets that I was a dirty rider or that I, right. you know, that I cheated or I did all these things that were, that were not right for the sport or for myself. I feel really good about my career and that, that I always made the right choices and, and, you know, did, did things the right way, I feel like. So uh, I hope people can just remember me for a, for a good, strong competitor that never gave up till, till uh, after the checkered flag. As a, as a guy who uh, spent a fair amount of time with a camera around my neck in the infield, there are certain Tucker Hibbert moments that I remember, whether it's uh, at Duluth, at Lake Geneva, at X Games, obviously. Um, the big win at, uh, at Deadwood, I was, I was uh, just watching that one on the computer. I wasn't there in person. But are, are, there, are there moments for you that are just crystal clear in your brain, like, like that 100th uh, victory in Deadwood where you went from the, the back to the front? Or I, I don't want to lead the jury. What, what moments are crystal clear for you? Yeah, definitely the 100th win is a, is a big one. And um, fortunately or unfortunately, however you want to look at it, I had, I've had quite a few crazy races at Deadwood. <laughs> I think three of them maybe that I came from last to first for some silly reason. And, and that happened to be one of them. So they all kind of blend together at that place. Um, but uh, yeah, that was a crazy moment for sure. And, you know, the other ones uh, are, are kind of some of the highlights of, of my racing is the first X games that I won and yeah. partly because I won and it was my first pro race, but, but also a big part of that was racing against my dad for the first time and having him place, fifth place in the race, which was his best X Games finish ever. Yeah. Uh, it was just like a kind of like a dream, right? Um, that whole scenario was a super cool, a lot of fun, a lot of good memories from that. Um, I bet. But yeah, there's, I don't know, there's so many, like you said, we could just go on and on about all these different races, but, um, but yeah, just a lot of good memories and a lot of good stories that go along with them that, that I'll hopefully never forget. Absolutely. So, um, uh, aside from from the the actual on the track performing, uh, what was the best part of being a professional uh, snowcross racer, and what was the maybe the most challenging part from your perspective that that people on the outside might not know about? Yeah, so probably the best would just be being able to do what I love and and turn it into a uh, a job and and something that I can do um, and not have to you know, not really have to focus or worry about anything else at the same time. So we were fortunate to have a great team and great sponsors that I was able to just a hundred percent put my energy towards racing while I was doing that. So, uh, that was probably the best thing for me as a racer was just to be able to put all my energy towards being the best I could be. And, uh, that's a good feeling when you have the opportunity to do that and I bet. it works and, and is successful. So definitely that was, uh, that was, one of the best things about being a racer. The worst would be, you know, I, I don't want to say the worst because I don't think there's any really most bad challenging. parts about it, but most challenging would be, you know, just being on the road all the time and having yeah. to make so many sacrifices. So for me as a person, like I, I didn't really have a normal childhood as far as, you know, the time aside from going to school, it was just always racing. Uh, and that was by choice. It's, it's 100% what I chose to do. But so many things in my life has, have kind of gotten pushed to the side and had to be put on hold, uh, time with family and, and just all kinds of things um, that, that I made the choice to put that time and energy into racing. And, um, and sometimes that can be tough, right? It's hard to make yeah. those decisions, hard to, hard to, you know, not do things that you feel like you should do, but you go racing instead. So it's, yep. uh, it's tough, but I, I think a lot of people just don't, fully understand what it takes to to compete at a super high level and and for so long like the length of the success that we had in my career was was a long time and to make that happen it just took ridiculous amounts of work and and effort so it's uh it's not always super fun but it's worth it in the end so so now that you're retired what uh, what about what about uh, uh being a snowcross racer do you miss well i definitely miss being on the track i've been watching um, pretty much all the races the last couple of years and, and it's fun to watch, but also I get frustrated, like just watching and thinking, <laughs> thinking about, you know, oh, what if I was out there? But, uh, for me, it's, you know, I'm totally happy to, to not be competing anymore and there's no regret whatsoever. 
Um, but I definitely miss being on the track and, and the feeling of finding a super good line and, and putting a, a really solid lap together and then just bringing it home to the finish. It's, uh, it's hard, hard not to miss those feelings, but at the same time, there's, there's plenty of other parts that I, that remind me that, uh, Oh yeah, that's maybe not so much fun. <laughs> the um, w whether it's uh, uh, racers or or professional athletes in in stick and ball sports or whatever, I, I know a lot of people when they retire they talk about trying to fill that competitive void that I'm, I've uh, spent my entire life competing, and now what do I compete at? Checkers? I mean, you, it, was that a difficult thing to uh, to turn off? You know, it really wasn't, and I thought okay. it would be, but for me, for whatever reason, I've been totally content not Good. really uh, competing that much. I mean, I, I race mountain bikes a little bit. Um, I always thought that as soon as I stopped racing snowmobiles, I would be full-time cyclist doing mountain bike racing, you know, 24-7. Yeah. Um, but for some reason, I haven't gotten that fired up about it. I do love to, to compete. I raced motocross a couple of times last summer locally, which was fun. That was the first time I've raced in quite a few years. And uh, it definitely was fun to get back on the track and feel, you know, that competitive drive and a little bit of adrenaline that goes with being on the starting line again. And, uh, but yeah, for me, it's been no problem. I'm just uh, happy with, with spending my time around home and, and with my wife, Mandy, and enjoying life for sure. Well, I know Mandy's been doing some bike races, so I hope you're writing press releases for her and doing all <laughs> the organization stuff that she did for you. I mean, it's only fair. Yeah, it is. Yeah, she it's kind of a, a role reversal here for sure. She is putting in a lot of effort and a lot of hours training on her bike, and and it's paying off. She's uh, she's feeling uh, fit and ready to race, and I'm kind of the opposite. I ride every now and again, and uh, I'll sit on the couch and eat a bowl of ice cream while she's riding her bicycle, and and things are definitely <laughs> things have changed for sure. And uh, yeah. it's fun for her because she's she says occasionally like she can understand a little more about what I was, what I was going through when I was training all the time and, and, uh, happen, happen to do workouts when you don't really feel like it and things like that. So it's, it's fun for her and, and I'm happy because she's doing something she loves and, uh, we both enjoy doing it together. So it's cool. Perfect. Now, Mandy tipped me off to, uh, something that, uh, you might have a little passion for and that's something to do with sleds from the nineties. Tell me, tell me what, uh, what, what you got going on there. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I uh, started buying these old these old Articats, long track Jags mostly, but yeah. yeah, I don't know what the deal is. I just needed a snowmobile for uh, for doing chores in the winter, hauling firewood and stuff. So I bought one, and all, all of a sudden I've got a lot more than one. So I th I think I have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> so so aside from collecting long track Jags, what else what else you got going on? How you how do you fill your days these days in uh, your uh, retired from snowcross life? Well, it's not uh, anything too exciting. I'm sorry to let let people down if they think I'm I'm this cool guy doing cool things. Uh, <laughs> relatively boring. Just uh, I, I like being at home. Honestly, it's it's uh, been a long time that I was racing and traveling and always on the go. And now my favorite thing is to see how many days I can go uh, without leaving the end of the driveway. So for me, I'm, I'm turning into a little bit of a hermit, but just uh, enjoying my time at home. And and I have. Uh, a million projects that I'm doing all at the same time. I can never seem to get to the end of what I'm trying to get done. So that keeps me plenty busy and, and occupied and, and happy. So I'm good. Good for you. Last question. Uh, any advice you'd have for, for uh, the, the person who wants to be the next Tucker Hibbert, some 15 year old kid out there that wants to go take on the pros? What, what, what advice would you give them just in, in, in life advice? Um, yeah, just do it. Have fun. <laughs> I mean, it's uh it's a blast being out there on the racetrack competing. And, and if you want to, you know, pursue racing as a career or as a hobby, just enjoy it, do the best you can and enjoy it for sure. And, um, I think, uh, if you want to, if you want to win at a, a professional level, be ready to do a lot of work and, and yeah. a lot of dedication, but just have fun. Perfect. All right. Well, Tucker Hibbert, we really appreciate you joining us on this and getting people caught up on, on what's going on in your life. And uh, seems like you're very happy and healthy and, and God bless that. So uh, thanks again. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it.